Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 8 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. In lecture 7, we discussed about different kinds of seismic waves which are generated at the source, primarily the P waves as well as the shear waves. When these waves interact with surficial and near surface mediums, again waves primarily Rayleigh wave and love waves come into picture. We also discuss about the characteristics of the medium through which these waves can propagate and also we discussed in lecture 7 that when these waves are passing through a particular medium, what kind of particle motion is generated. Recalling that when primary waves are passing through a particular medium, there will be compression and rarefaction. There will be particle motion happening in longitudinal direction. When shear wave is passing through a particular medium, it will cause back and forth motion in perpendicular direction or shearing in perpendicular direction as a result of which there will be shearing happening in perpendicular direction in horizontal plane as well as in vertical plane. Collectively, if we are interested to find out the shearing happening in a particular plane, so that can be approximated by means of application of torque on a particular section. We also discussed about primary wave and secondary wave shear zones, uh, shadow zones, which are primarily because of significant change in the physical properties of the medium and depending upon the whether the medium is offering resistance to propagation of wave or not, some waves will be able to propagate through solid liquid also, other waves will not be able to pro propagate through liquid as well as gas. As a result, there will be shadow zones where with respect to epicenter, there will be some azimuth range within which you will not have any primary wave. Similarly, there will be some range of azimuth with respect to epicenter where there will not be any shear waves. So, as a result of this, there will be shadow zone for primary wave as well as shear waves. In addition, we discuss about ground rows which are uh, particularly the characteristics when a rally wave is passing through a particular medium representing elliptical motion in the particle. We also discussed that the amplitude of Rayleigh wave as well as love wave significantly reduce as we move from ground surface to deeper depths. If you go to love waves, there will be motion completely in horizontal plane, there will not be any motion in vertical plane. Then as we discussed that these ground motion recordings or seismic waves will be reaching to different different recording stations. So, it will be starting from the source and will start propagating in all the direction. If we are having a recording station, wave will reach to a recording station and thus the recording station will sense the characteristics of the wave as these change with respect to time. If you start analyzing the seismogram that is the ground motion signature recorded by a recording station, one is also able to understand where the primary wave content is coming into picture, where shear wave is coming into picture. And accordingly, we can utilize this information that is the arrival time of primary wave, the arrival time of shear wave which is marked at a recording station by means of ground motion record. Use it to understand and locate primarily the location of the earthquake that we generally target to locate the epicenter of the earthquake. We also discussed in yesterday uh, in lecture uh, 7 that we have to have such records of arrival time of primary wave and secondary wave from at least three number of recording stations. If it is less than three number of recording station, then we may narrow down to some area which is significantly larger than actual area of epicenter location, which can be narrowed down if record from more number of recording station is there. So, referring to that question. Uh, the methodology which we discussed in lecture 7, we will be solving by numerical first and then we will proceed towards other topics which are primarily related to earthquake intensity as well as magnitude and in the end we will also touch upon what is the seismic wave attenuation happening uh, during the propagation path primarily. So, taking into account the formula which we discuss about if we know the time of primary wave or secondary wave reaching to a recording station and velocity, 
that can be correlated with respect to the distance from which primary wave or secondary wave was generated. But in this particular case, since the actual time of arrival is also dependent upon when the earthquake wave has started from the source and with respect to that how much delay when the wave is reaching to a particular recording station. So, many a times getting exact information about the arrival time of primary wave as well as secondary wave is difficult. So, if we continue this particular uh, derivation, we'll, similarly we can also drive the time for shear wave arrival at a recording station that is T s equals to d over V s, where T s is the arrival time of shear wave, d is the distance. In this particular case, this dip distance represents epicentral distance and V s is the shear wave pro propagation velocity from a particular medium. Here whenever we are talking about medium, primarily we are focusing on crystal medium through which between the source that is the focus and under the recording station again at maybe weathered rock or maybe intact rock medium, wave will be maximum content of the wave will, will be transferred and then subsequently these will be interacting with near surface material. So, we will be targeting with respect to the crystal velocity of primary wave and secondary wave and then time for primary wave similarly can be obtained using this as T p equals to d over V p, where T p is the time of arrival of primary wave, d is the epicentral distance and V p is the wave propagation velocity of primary wave in the medium of interest. So, using these as we discussed in lecture 7, if we take the difference between the two time of arrival, definitely the time of arrival of shear wave will be more in comparison to primary wave because in comparison to primary wave, shear waves travel at relatively low value. So, as a result the time of arrival of shear wave will be more in comparison to uh, primary wave arrival time. So, the difference between these two will be called always as T s minus T p. Referring to the equations which were given in uh, equation number 1 and equation 2, T s minus T p can be correlated with respect to the wave propagation velocity V p minus V s over V p times V s into capital D which is the epicentral distance. So, using this rearranging the terms of equation 3, one can determine the value of capital D is a function of V p, V s, T s, T p difference. So, that means absolute value of primary and shear wave velocities and the arrival time difference between shear wave and primary wave at a recording station because of one particular earthquake event. So, we cannot take T s value from one particular earthquake and T p value from other earthquake or T s value from one recording station, T p value from other recording station. So, both these values of T s and T p have to be corresponding to same earthquake, same earthquake and same recording station. only then this formula you can use it. So, d value which is the epicentral distance is correlated with respect to all these parameters. Now, the value in order to use equation number 4, the value of V s and V p should be known. Unless these values for a particular terrain is, is uh, known, we cannot use this particular formula. So, one can refer to existing literature to find out how much is the on an average wave propagation velocity in the medium of interest. So, using this, now this equation, the value of d is an indication of range of distance, range of radial distance, it should not be called as range, it is a radial distance with respect to recording station where the epicenter can be located, where epicenter can be located. So, that means, if this is my recording station, considering d as the radial distance, so anything around this particular radius of capital D is the tentative region, 
टेंटेटिव रीजन ऑफ अर्थक्वेक एपिसेंटर सो दिस इज टेंटेटिव रीजन ऑफ वेयर एनी वेयर विद इन दिस पर्टिकुलर रीजन अर्थक्वेक लोकेशन कैन बी मार्क्ड नाउ इन ऑर्डर टू रिड्यूस दिस पर्टिकुलर रीजन विच इज प्रोबेबल लोकेशन फॉर अर्थ क्वेक एपिसेंटर वी हैव टू हैव सिमिलर वैल्यूज ऑफ डी फ्रॉम मोर नंबर ऑफ रिकॉर्डिंग स्टेशन एंड डेफिनेटली इफ दीज रिकॉर्डिंग स्टेशन आर इन नियर बाई रीजन वी कैन एक्सपेक्ट दैट द सर्किल फ्रॉम मल्टीपल रिकॉर्डिंग स्टेशन विल मर्ज एट सम कॉमन एरिया विच इज पॉसिबल इंडिकेशन ऑफ द एपिसेंट ऑफ द अर्थ क्वेक सो दिस इज फर्स्ट मैथड इन विच थ्री सर्किल मैथड वेयर वी विल टेक द एपिसेंटर सो दीज आर बेसिकली रिप्रेजेंटिंग द कॉर्डिनेट्स coordinates of recording stations recording station 1 recording station 2 and recording station 3 you will be having let alone values and based on these values you can locate these points and then based on the value of d1 d2 d3 calculated using equation number 4 we can develop three circles which are shown over here now this is the common area which is marked over here this is the common area to all the three circles common area to all three circles so this common area can be very small it can be quite bigger also so in case it is larger than significant the uh, uh, very small area then we can have maybe more number of recording station if available that can also be referred so that this particular area which is common area to all circle representing epicenter location representing location of the epicenter so this is the location is seismograph coordinates using the record from seismograph one can determine the value of d1 d2 d3 plot these on a graph sheet on same scale and then we will be able to find out the location which is common to all the recording station now referring to this particular part there is one numerical where it is given that the arrival time of primary and secondary wave at different seismographs located at different sites means at different different locations but certainly in close by regions so the recording station are, uh, that p wave arrival time s wave arrival time is given and let lon of that particular seismograph is given and then it is also given that 1 degree of latitude equals to 111 km and longitude it is corresponding to 88.2 km respect to the given value of latitude so generally ref when you are converting longitude to kilometers you will also refer to what is the latitude of that particular location and use it so this can this has to be estimated based on uh, three circle method so using these values firstly we can determine how much is the time difference between p and s wave and using the la la the latitude value and longitude value which is also converted to kilometer using latitude value of that recording station so in the end we will be able to get both the coordinates in kilometers using those we can locate the location of these epicenters on graph sheet so let's see the epicentral distance here we are directly calling it as epicentral distance for station 1 station 1 epicentral distance so that can be called as d1 equals to ts minus tp which is already given in the table over vp minus vs times vp vs so if we put the values over here which are given we'll get ts minus tp value equals to 7.97 seconds and the average value city of primary wave propagation and shear wave propagation is taken as 6 and 3 km per second respectively so using this one can determine the value of this as 47.82 km 
be careful with the units. Remember here the velocity is given in kilometer per second, time is also given in kilometer. So, the value of d1 should be kilometer per uh, kilometer value. Similarly, epicentral distance for second recording station distance for station 2 which I am calling it as D2 will be equals to Ts minus Tp which is given over here as 3.87 seconds divided by 3 which is directly the same value multiply by 6 into 3 which is taken directly from the above part. This is going to give you 23.22 kilometer as the radial distance from station 2 where epicenter can be located. Third part is epicenter location or epicenter distance with respect to station number 3. So, D 3 again can be calculated as T s minus T p which is given for station number 3 as 6.27 seconds divided by 3 into 6 into 3 which is going to give you 37.62 kilometer. So, we are having the value of D, S, D 1, D 2, D 3 using this and taking the coordinate of the recording station we will be able to develop these particular three circles. So, I am not actually uh, uh, explaining here how to convert latitude to kilometer and longitude to kilometer. The conversion factor is given in the question itself. You can refer to that and solve to find out the value of coordinates in kilometers, latitude and longitude for all the three recording stations. Once you plot it using suitable scale on a graph sheet, you will be able to locate point D 1, D 2 and D 3 that is based on the coordinates of the recording station. Then taking the value of D 1, D 2, D 3 which is representation of this particular distance, D 2 is representation of this particular distance, D 3 is a representation of this particular distance. One we will be able to develop these three circles and the common area corresponding to this is basically this particular area. So, on the same graph sheet one can read how much kilometer along x axis, how much kilometer on y axis, convert it from kilometer to degrees, one we will be able to determine the epicenter coordinate. So, initially we converted from lat long values to kilometer values from degrees to kilometer, again once we are getting from here in kilometer, we will convert that to degree. So, that is how one can locate the epicenter of the earthquake. If ground motion records where one is able to locate the arrival time of primary wave and secondary wave and B s value and V p value of a recording station is known, one can refer to this and determine the location of the earthquake. Now, another uh, thing is the intensity of the earthquake. We discuss about whenever there is uh, uh, wave generated the source, it is reaching to a recording station, we will be able to determine the sense or characteristics of the ground motion which are detected at a recording station. Now, as we know that recording of a particular earthquake by means of sensors or by means of rotating drum where uh, uh, the pen used to mark the signature of the ground motion has been a recent development. Maybe in last 40, 50 years, this ground motion recording has become more prominent. However, if we discuss about earthquakes and its related damages, most of the damages related to great earthquake which have happened in uh, 1700, 1800, 1900, most of, the most of the damages have been known in terms of casualties, in terms of building damage, in terms of may be some scenario which was witnessed by people living in the epicentral region or in the region where lot of damages had happened. So, certainly whenever earthquake ground motion record are, are there, we have those records for understanding the ground motion characteristics and even for generating synthetic ground motions. But at the same time we cannot completely ignore 
that such records of ground motion are very limited, which is like for last 50 years, 60 years. However, if we have some information about some damaging earthquake which has happened in last 200 years, 300 years like that, we will get more information about what is the damaging characteristics of the earthquake. So, referring to this and in the absence of any ground motion recording instrument, the only way which many a times researchers have referred to is measuring the intensity of earthquake. Please remember the intensity of earthquake is a qualitative measure. So, one when is interested to find out the intensity of the earthquake, it is a qualitative measure means how much damage characteristics I am able to see at a particular site, what actually I witness which I can call like because of a particular earthquake this much devastation has happened that is qualitative because I may say it was very shaky, other may say the shaking was very nominal or moderate. So, it is qualitative, but generally the intensity value is basically representation of what is the destructiveness of a particular earthquake, how much destruction, how much devastation earthquake has caused at a particular location. As I mentioned in the absence of ground motion recording, because that has only started in last 70 years, 60 years such information which are though not measured by means of an instrument, but is giving you a qualitative information about the destructiveness of an earthquake is basically very helpful whenever ground motion record is not there, because it is going to tell you the destructiveness of an earthquake, it is going to tell you how much earthquake can cause damage, casualties, catastrophes, collapse of the building, even many a times if we run one referred to uh, intensity maps or intensity scales, it is clearly mentioned the waves were so intense even it was visible near the ground surface. So, particle motion was visible near the ground surface was also one of the signature which people have witnessed and it cannot be denied that since there was no recording instrument such ground motion was not witnessed. So, these are very helpful, generally it is measured in terms of how the earthquake has affected in terms of ground shaking, in terms of building damage, in terms of damage to dams, bridges and other structures as witnessed by a particular uh, person who is staying in the particular area. So, it is like whenever particular damage has happened during a particular earthquake, one can visit those particular sites as used to happen in um, earlier days also that whenever some earthquake caused lot of devastation then specific team or researchers used to visit particular locations, they will interview people and understand try to understand what actually they witnessed during a particular earthquake. In addition they will also see if connectivity is uh, resumed within a short span of time then certainly people can go and themselves they can witness uh, what damages have happened. Otherwise, if the, if the connectivity is not there, then they have to solely rely on the people who are already there in the area undergone de, uh, destruction. So, if we go there, we interview people what actually you have witnessed during a particular earthquake and depending upon what classification, what information they are going to tell, they are standard classification charts. So, we can compare what the particular person observer is telling about the damage of an earthquake, if we are able to witness those damages also by visiting a particular site provided the connectivity to that particular site in terms of air connectivity, rail connectivity, road connectivity has been resumed before the rehabilitation work has completely started. So, once this particular destructiveness of an earthquake is either experienced by observer or experienced by a researcher or researcher team we can compare this with respect to the maps, so uh, the, the charts which have been given by different uh, intensity scales and then depending upon which particular intensity scale is describing the similar characteristics of devastation, we will assign the same value of intensity to the particular area. Since the values are assigned as per the sense of an individual, there are always uncertainty I may say it is very damaging, other may say it was moderate or even the third person who is not that much sensible with respect to uh, earthquake shaking may say I did not feel at all. 
So, uh, many a times there are a lot of uncertainty with respect to assigning intensity to a particular location where uh, the person who is known to intensity scale has not ex been exposed directly to the devastations happened in the particular region. But I, as, as I mentioned that particularly in India if you refer to earthquakes like 1905, Kangra earthquake 1934, Bihar Nepal earthquake 1897, Shillong earthquake 1950, Assam earthquake and many more earthquakes. So, these all earthquake caused lot of devastation, but unfortunately there were no ground motion recordings available. So, only because of the intensity maps which are available to us in present, we are able to understand the damaging characteristics of those earthquakes, response of important building during those earthquakes and also we, that will also help in understanding that even this kind of damages if witnessed in future, what likely to be done measures can be taken into account. So, that such damages need not get repeated in the future, it can get, it, it, it can be minimized to a significant level. So, qualitative it is, uh, we cannot, uh, we have to keep in mind that it is qualitative measure, primarily looking into the effects of ground shaking that to qualitative effects in terms of damages, values are assigned as per the sense of an individual, maybe you can uh, interview more than one person and see what they are sensing and then based on the classification of damages reported by the people, one can go and assign intensity. So, there are many intensity scales one can refer to, one is modified Mercalli intensity scale, rossi ferrell intensity scale, EMS or European macro seismic scale, then Japanese meteorological agency scale or JMA scale and Manwave spoon humor Karnik scale. Since the intensity of earthquake is different, so it is not constant, whenever we are referring to intensity of a particular earthquake, it is mostly related to the damage happened at that particular location. So, if I am telling a particular uh, site has an intensity of 7, that means whatever damage happened at that particular site X was representation or uh, of intensity 7 as per a particular intensity scale. Again, I will go to another site Y which may be located very close or in different direction with respect to epicenter which might have experienced more damage then certainly I will assign higher intensity value to that particular location Y. So, that means depending upon the destructiveness even during same earthquake the intensity of damage and the intensity values can assign be different. So, different values can be assigned to different stations depending upon how much damage, what is the characteristics of damage experienced during same earthquake at different different locations. So, points if you join the points having same value of intensity, you will be able to develop contours. So, contour map joining same intensity values are called as isoseism, those are called as isoseism contours joining contour of same intensity, same earthquake intensity that is called as isoseism and using same value you will be having multiple isoseism because you are going to study the damage in a particular region because of a particular earthquake. So, there will be number of contours. So, such maps which are representing summation of all intensity maps or all intensity contours are called as isoseismal map of an earthquake. So, if one is interested, one can refer to what an intensity map look like. There are intensity maps available for 1934 earthquake, 1905 earthquake, 1897 Shillong earthquake and many more earthquakes. So, one can refer to the intensity maps which are available for those earthquakes and even without having ground motion record that will give an understanding about what uh, level of damage, devastation had actually triggered during these historic earthquakes or these earthquakes where ground motion records are not available. So, one particularly uh, the intensity scale which is widely referred is modified Mercalli intensity. We can see over here that the intensity value is ranging from 1 to 12. Intensity 1 represents the earthquake was not felt at all intensity 2 
The shaking was felt by a few people, suspended objectives, uh, suspended objects started swing, swinging. Same way if you go to intensity 6, felt by everyone, some heavy furniture moved, slight damages were also witnessed during that particular earthquake. Same if you go to 9, damage is great in well built structure, even well built structure undergone significant damage. Partial collapse also happened in some of the well built structure. Building shifted off foundation. So, there was tilting in the building, there was differential settlement in the buildings also. Similarly, intensity value of 12, total damage, even line of sight and level were distorted and objects were thrown in air. So, this is basically more elaborate discussion about when you will assign intensity value of 12 to a particular recording station or a particular observation site just by comparing the damage which has happened at that particular location with respect to the classification of damage for different different intensities given in this particular chart. So, if we are comparing the damage with respect to this particular chart, we will say MMI values, this is called as modified Mercalli intensity or MMI, this is generally referred in terms of MMI represented in Roman number as mentioned over here. So, depending upon the damage, we will compare over here and then assign a Roman number of MMI 6, MMI 7 and then later on it will be also used to refer what kind of damage was witnessed. Similarly, Japan Meteorological Agency, they also came up with different scale, so where he can see zero intensity is also there and this intensity scale is varying from 0 to 7. So, 7 intensity means thrown by shaking and impossible to move around at all. Intensity 6, lower and upper are there, so difficult to keep standing. Upper is there, impossible to keep standing and without move without crawling. So, this is basically some description of what has actually witnessed during that particular earthquake shaking and compare with the respect to intensity scale, one can refer to GRA value of 4, one can refer to GRA value of 7, so GMA value of 4, GMA value of 7. So, that is basically describing the uh, destructiveness of a particular earthquake at your observation location. As I mentioned, this value keeps on changing as you are moving from one recording station to one side to other side. Many a times even now also, like 2015 Nepal earthquake, Turkey earthquake, even recent times also whenever we are getting ground motion records in terms of peak ground acceleration, spectral acceleration values, peak ground velocity, peak ground displacement values, many a times we'll, we also come across the intensity values by agencies. So, both values intensity as well as ground motion signature are reported nowadays. Again European macro seismic scale or EMS scale, here we can see the intensity is uh, is correlative with respect to the magnitude also. So, if we are referring to micro, then less than 2 magnitude earthquake generally referred to as micro and then you will say not felt at all. Similarly, 7 to 7.9, you call those earthquakes as major earthquakes and then cause senior damages over larger area. And if we see in terms of frequency, at least 15 earthquakes per year on an average are reported across the globe which are major earthquakes. 9, 9 to 9.9, .9, it is quite devastating. That, that, uh, the devastation is can, can be clearly witnessed in several thousands of kilometers across the epicentral region. And generally, these are reported once in 10 years and even many a times less than that also. Above 10, maximum reported earthquake was close to 9.2. Above 10, generally not reported. So, that is why it is not reported so far. So, here we can see about the classification as well as correlative with respect to magnitude as well as how frequently such earthquakes are happening across the globe. Same way with respect to RFI or rosiferal intensity scale which was proposed, here we can see again the scale is varying from 1 to 10, 1 again referring to recorded by single seismograph or the shock felt by an experiment, experienced observer only. So, many a time people are not sensible with respect to uh, very low value of shaking, but some people are very sensitive, so they will be only able to 
understand that there has been some shock, some uh, kind of vibration in the ground has been sensed by experience observer. Similarly, if you go with intensity of 6, fairly strong shock, general awakening of those which were awake, uh, were asleep, ringing of bell, oscillation of chandeliers, stopping of clock. Again, 8, very strong, falling of chimney, cracks in the wall of the building were witnessed. So, if you are witnessing these things, you simply assign an intensity value of 8 in RFI scale. Please remember, whenever we are developing an intensity map or whenever we are explaining that a particular site had undergone damage corresponding to that intensity, we have to also refer to which scale one is referring to. Because here, going with this particular part, certainly we cannot say RFI value equals RFI of 12 because the intensity scale does not go to 12. So, it goes to 12, but not in RFI, it goes in MMI value. So, one has to be very particular about which particular intensity scale you are using and corresponding to that value of intensity, whether the actual damage at a particular site were also witnessed or not. So, one has to be very careful while assigning intensity and developing the isocesional maps. Now, as I mentioned that firstly is intensity though it is important because whenever earthquake records were not there, destructiveness of an earthquake can be correlated very well with respect to intensity values and it is primarily the, the intensity or isocesional maps for historic earthquakes which are known, which many a times are referred even now while generating synthetic ground motion, while understanding the, that the such devastation should not be repeated in near future. But at the same time, it is a qualitative measure. I may say it was very intense, you may say it is very, it, is, it was moderate or it was minor intensity values. I may say building damage during a particular earthquake, other may say the, the damage was very minimal to call it as significant damage. So, it is again qualitative measure and it certainly depends upon how the, the person whom we are interviewing, the, the observer whom we are interviewing to develop intensity map, how much that particular person is sensible to ground motion. Thirdly, we cannot deny the fact that intensity at a particular station can only be assigned when some signature of ground motion, uh, ground damage is actually available to the particular site of interest. That means, if there is a site where there is no building, there is uh, no one staying there, certainly how we are going to quantify the intensity of that particular earthquake. So, we cannot assign that intensity even though the ground vibrations was, were more because no one was actually present there to witness or to feel some characteristics of ground motions or shock which was witnessed at that particular site during a particular earthquake. So, keeping those, there will be always uncertainty with respect to intensity values because these are uh, based on individual's experience which may vary from one person to other. Secondly, the intensity value is not constant, it keeps on changing depending upon the region and how much damage has triggered in that particular region. So, in order to actually quantify the, uh, the magnitude of the earthquake is a better term which is primarily dependent upon the ground motion signature available at a recording station. So, unlike intensity which determines the effect of an earthquake motion on a building or a person, earthquake magnitude is a measure of the size of the earthquake, how big was the earthquake, it is measured, it is constant value for an earthquake and is not a variable just like intensity. So, intensity was changing with respect to the site of observation, earthquake magnitude remain constant and is directly related to the size of the earthquake which has happened. So, size of the earthquake during a particular earthquake is not changing with respect to location, hence the intensity values may change, but not the magnitude. Since the earthquake magnitude is determined using suitable ground motion records, the determination is a quantitative value. Intensity was qualitative, this is quantitative measures, it is going to give you always some value of quantity, how much was the magnitude and for that particular earthquake magnitude, uh, uh, for that particular earthquake the magnitude value remains constant. E step increase in earthquake magnitude 
represents an increase in amplitude of the vibration by a factor of 10. So, if we are talking about two earthquakes, one is having magnitude 5, other is having magnitude 6, then magnitude 6 will have more than 10 times higher amplitude with respect to magnitude 5 earthquake. Thus, vibration caused by magnitude 2 will be 10 times higher than magnitude 1. If we are comparing 3 and 1, it will be 100 times. So, 10 times between 1 and 2 and again 10 times between 2 and 3, so it will be 100 times more. Increase in seismic energy on the other end because whenever rupture is happening at the particular fault, there will be a release of seismic energy in terms of seismic waves which are propagating and carrying the seismic energy to larger distances. When this seismic energy is interacting with the medium, soil, structure, building, dams, tunnels, it will, it will uh, sometime it will undergo partial damage, sometime it will be always ground shaking, sometime increase in pore water pressure, sometime complete collapse. So, this increase in seismic energy is 30 times higher when one increase in the magnitude of the earthquake. So, that means magnitude 5 will be have, will be releasing 30 times more energy in comparison to magnitude 4 earthquake. Magnitude 6 will be releasing 900 times more energy with respect to magnitude 4 earthquake. So, 4 to 5 30 times, 5 to 6 30 times. So, 30 into 30. 900 times more energy will be released with respect to magnitude 4 when magnitude 6 earthquake happens. The largest ever recorded earthquake was approximately 9.2 magnitude earthquake. Beyond 9.2 is not possible many a times because before any further continuation of seismic energy continues in the rocks, there will be some earthquake or there will be some failure in the material alone. So, various magnitude scales have been developed to calibrate the ground motion characteristics and to take those ground motion properties to find out how much energy has been released during a particular earthquake. So, type of magnitude during a particular earthquake, one is Richter magnitude or local magnitude. As I uh, mentioned that firstly Richter magnitude came into picture where which will take into account Wood Anderson seismograph consisting of a rotating drum and marking the ground motion by means of stylus or a pencil. This particular scale many a time we will also hear about local scales. So, more or less both terms are used back and forth. Other one is seismic moment magnitude or moment magnitude MW which is more prominent with respect to the energy release. Then body wave magnitude which primarily use content of body wave, surface wave magnitude. So, these are primarily the four ways in which one will come across whenever there is an earthquake, there is a magnitude of a particular earthquake. In addition, many a times it is also given that in which particular scale one is referred to those magnitude, whether it is a body wave magnitude, surface wave magnitude, Richter magnitude or seismic moment magnitude or moment magnitude. So, Richter scale it was developed. So, it was proposed by Charles Richter using Wood Anderson seismometer. The scale was designed for earthquake in Southern California and recorded by a network of Wood Anderson seismometers. All the uh, scales which exist today stem from one scale that is Richter magnitude that gives an idea that ground motion signature alone can be used to find out the size of the earthquake. So, this is now here we can see ML which is definition of Richter magnitude, it is a function of log A which is the maximum amplitude traced in millimeter by a Wood Anderson seismometer. F delta is empirically determined calibrating function of the epicentral distance delta, the value of delta is 0 for epicentral distance of 100, for other values of delta there are calibration charts and empirical correlations are also available. So, you put the values of delta over here, then we will get the value of F delta and corresponding to the same recording station which is located at delta epicentral distance, how much is the maximum trace amplitude in millimeter. So, using those values of A and F delta put in this particular equation, one will be able to determine how much is the local magnitude or Richter magnitude. 
the value of ml obtained at nearby stations are somehow smaller than those of distant stations primarily because of attenuation was not properly accounted in richter scale it is used to measure the amplitude at specific frequency example 1 hertz while the frequency of moderate to large earthquake beyond will have even lower frequency values the earthquake sites could not be measured from just single seismometer thus analyzing data from multiple number of ground motion records located uh, globally used to delay many a times the establishment of magnitude of a particular earthquake and richter scale generally saturated 6.5 magnitude and thus many a times whenever a larger magnitude earthquake happens it will report 6.5 magnitude and thus it will underestimate the seismic energy released during bigger earthquakes now here when we can see about the magnitude of the earthquake take a ground motion signature so here we can see that based on the signature one we can get is what is the peak amplitude or how much is the peak motion with respect to its mean position which has been detected by a recording station using those peak amplitude and taking the location of the recording station as well as the difference in the time between p and s wave one can locate the loca one can locate the point on this particular vertical line as well as in this particular line joining those two points whenever it is passing through the magnitude line this will also give you an understanding about what is the magnitude of the earthquake which triggered particular p and s wave arrival time difference at a recording station given over here and also triggered a maximum magnitude uh, maximum amplitude of vibration as mentioned on right hand side line so this is independent of uh, the formula which is given earlier so using this also one can determine how much is the uh, magnitude of a particular earthquake now moment magnitude which is given over here as all the magnitude scales let me uh, go to seismic moment magnitude first so surface wave magnitude first let me go through which was proposed in 1945 by gutenberg the richter scale does not differentiate between different kinds of wave types that means whether it is body waves surface waves it does not differentiate at considerable epicentral distance the most of the body wave would have attenuated and thus most of the damage will be caused by surface waves so even at larger distance if there is ground motion record how that can be used to find out the magnitude of the earthquake so surface wave magnitude is generally determined by taking into account the amplitude of rally wave marked at a recording station ms equals to log a plus 1.656 log delta plus 1.818 where a is the amplitude combined amplitude so you will be having east west and north south component so combined amplitude in east west and north south direction measured in micron micrometer of i mean this is the amplitude of rally wave measured in micron corresponding to 20 second and delta is the epicentral distance in degree so using the value of delta equals to epicentral distance a is the amplitude at a recording station corresponding to 20 second and the station is located at delta degree epicentral distance put those values using this particular equation one will be able to determine how much is the surface wave magnitude value the coefficient values many a times change also with respect to the region of interest but the functional form of the equation remains the same the equation was primarily developed for pasadena earthquakes and thus for different region one can have different values of values again this particular magnitude scale that is surface wave magnitude scale also saturated 8 magnitude value again body wave magnitude for deep focus earthquake surface wave magnitude will not produce surface waves will not be produced by deep focus earthquake hence reliable estimation of 
size of the earthquake will be difficult from body uh, surface wave record. So, one has to go with uh, body wave magnitude. So, we, here we can see body wave magnitude equals to log a plus log t plus 0.01 delta plus 5.9. So, here a is the P wave maximum amplitude, maximum means combination of both horizontal and uh, I mean combination of both horizontal component, both horizontal component that means in east west and north south direction. T is the period corresponding to the maximum amplitude and delta is the value of epicentral distance in degree. Put the value of A, T and delta that will give you how much is the value of body wave magnitude during a particular earthquake. Again this particular scale of body wave magnitude also saturates at 6.5 magnitude. So, we discuss about body wave magnitude, we discuss about uh, surface wave magnitude that means depending upon the location of the epicentral distance. Whenever we are very close we can refer to body wave magnitude. When you are looking at distance generally more than twice the thickness of the earth's crust more we can refer to surface wave magnitude. Richter scale was there, but it was not able to differentiate between surface wave and body wave and over that there was saturation with respect to above 6.5 magnitude earthquake. So, considering the limitation with respect to all these intensity scales, another scale which was moment magnitude scale was proposed by Hanks and Kenamuri in 1979. So, this particular scale we can refer that earlier scale were having primarily related to saturation similarly, similarly with respect to position of the epicenter, uh, the recording station with respect to location of the earthquake, some limitations. So, all the earlier scale were used to measure the size of the earthquake based on amplitude of ground shaking. It was not directly an indication of how much energy released during a particular earthquake. However, the level of shaking is not directly a function of the earthquake size. With increase in earthquake size as we discussed many a time the amplitude of ground vibration may not increase significantly primarily at low magnitude uh, low frequency values. So, overcoming these limitations of local magnitude scale, body wave magnitude scale and surface wave magnitude scale, Hanks and Kanamuri in 1979 proposed moment magnitude scale which basically quantifies uh, in terms of how much energy is released during a particular earthquake. So, seismic moment which is given over here is a function of mu which is the shear modulus of medium undergoing failure. In this particular case if it is crystal medium where failure is happening it will be approximate value it is given as 32 giga Pascal. If it is in mantle 75 giga Pascal, certainly one can refer to the existing literature to find out how much is the uh, shear modulus of a crystal medium as well as in mantle medium to be taken into account to find out the moment magnitude. So, the value of mu in this particular equation should be used in dyne per centimeter square. Similarly, the value of capital U is average slip which has happened during a particular earthquake and should be measured in centimeter capital A is rupture area that means the area along the length and width measured on the fault plane in terms of centimeter square. So, using all these terms mu in 9 per centimeter square, u in centimeter and A in centimeter square you can put over here then you can determine the value of seismic moment. Again that can be converted to moment magnitude as 2 by 3 log m naught minus 10.7 which was again proposed by Hanks and Kanamuri 1979. So, using this one can determine firstly the seismic moment using specific values of shear modulus, slip and rupture area and then subsequently it can be determined with respect to the m w value that is moment magnitude. Seismic energy also can be determined as log E equals to 11.8 plus 1.5 times m w. So, one can refer to m w if existing correlations are there. So, m s value also can be converted to m w and then you can utilize it. So, this is the uh, method based on which one can determine actually how much 
seismic energy is being released during a particular earthquake. Since this particular scale is directly related to the amount of energy released during a particular earthquake, this particular scale does not saturate and gives a clear indication about how much energy is released during a particular earthquake. So, let us solve a numerical. An earthquake caused an average slip of 5 meter during strike slip faulting and this triggered 100 kilometer and 20 kilometer portion to undergo rupture. Assuming that the rock along the fault has an average rupture strength of 200 kPa, estimate the seismic moment and moment magnitude of the earthquake. Solution. So, magnitude is related to seismic moment. Firstly, determine the seismic moment. So, 200 kPa, it should be 2 into 10 raise to the power 6, 9 per centimeter square. Area which is undergoing rupture or involved in this particular earthquake process is 100 kilometer by 20 kilometer. So, convert the same into centimeter square. U average slip was which was 5 meter equals to 500 centimeter. Using this, one can determine how much is the seismic moment in terms of 9 centimeter. Again, using this particular equation which is given over here 2 by 3 log m naught minus 10.7. The seismic moment which is determined over here can be used to find out the value of moment magnitude. So, this is the value one can get. Now, we discuss about intensity, we discuss about the magnitude. Using the information about earthquake parameters, we can classify same earthquake into based on focal depth, based upon the range of epicentral distance based upon where it has happened, based upon the cause of the earthquake. So, in variety of ways one can classify the earthquake. First one is given based on the focal depth. So, if the focal depth of the earthquake is less than 70 kilometer, you call it as shallow focus earthquake. If it is between 70 to 300 kilometer, you call it as mid or intermediate focus earthquake. If it is between 3 to 300 to 700, you call it as deep focus earthquake. Generally, no earthquake is reported beyond 700 kilometer focal depth. Similarly, with respect to magnitude, if the magnitude of the earthquake is 3 to 3.9, it is called as minor earthquake and subsequently all classifications are given over here. Many a times, we will come across a term called great earthquake. So, great earthquake means not in terms of damages, it is certainly a terminology given to an earthquake which is having magnitude of 8 and above. So, anything which is having magnitude of 8 and above that is called as great earthquake. In terms of location, if it is happening at the plate boundary, one can call it as interplate earthquake. If it is within the plate boundary, within the plate but away from the plate boundary, it is called as intraplate earthquake. Based on the cause, one can call it as tectonic earthquake. If it is based on seismic activity, if it is not based on seismic activity, one can call it as non tectonic earthquake. An earthquake, same earthquake which based on the focal depth, based on the magnitude, based on the location, based upon the cause can be classified maybe shallow focus earthquake, minor earthquake, intraplate earthquake, non tectonic earthquake. If the location is within 1 degree epicentral distance from the recording station, you can call it as local earthquake. If it is between 1 to 10 degree, you call it as regional earthquake. If it is above 10 degree, you call it as tele seismic event. So, these all we have discussed already. Now, magnitude is qualitative, uh, quantitative, intensity is qualitative. Magnitude is measured in terms of energy release, Quant intensity is based on the amount of damages reported. Magnitude is generally reported up to first decimal place, intensity is reported generally in Roman numbers. So, it is independent of size and surface condition, but magnitude certainly depends upon surface condition because that will govern or control surface scenario of damage. So, one can differentiate between magnitude and uh, intensity is like the amount of energy which is required to switch on one bulb remain constant. So, that is indication of magnitude and the intensity of light if you are very close to the bulb and as you move away from the bulb the intensity of light keeps on changing. So, that if you one can say like 
how is the intensity of light changing with respect to distance same way with respect to earthquake intensity depending upon the damage one can say the intensity value is changing may be away from the epicenter or even within the epicentral distance. Okay, last term uh, for this particular lecture is seismic wave attenuation. Generally, whenever waves are generated at the source and start propagating directly they will not reach to a recording station between the source which is located may be certain kilometer depth beneath the ground surface wave will start propagating and when these waves are propagating through the medium there will be uh, these waves will cause particle oscillation this wave has moved from uh, the epicenter these are moving in three dimensional space. So, again there will be lot of scattering happening over here collectively because of these processes whether it is heat because of particle motion because of scattering and elastic attenuation there will be redistribution of energy at every point the wave is progressing in the propagation medium. As a result of this redistribution generally a decrease in the amplitude of the wave away from the focus is observed. So, this phenomena which is resultant of which is resulting in the attenuation or decrease in the amplitude of the wave that is called as seismic wave attenuation. This primarily happens due to two factor one is geometric spreading because as you are moving away from the epicenter a larger area because wave is distributing in three dimensional space. So, as you move away from the epicenter though it is starting from a point or a particular rupture area as it grows larger area is now involved. So, there will be redistribution of energy it is covering larger area. So, geometric spreading larger geometry is now involved in which the waves are spreaded spherical wave fronts that is what I am mentioning. The geometrical spreading account for reduction in the amplitude of a given seismic wave front as the area of wave front increases and one has to conserve the energy. So, as you move away there will be reduction in the wave energy. Second one is anelastic attenuation. So, when waves are interacting with the medium we have discussed that each time every wave is propagating through a particular medium there will be oscillation in the particle because of this motion there will be relative motion in the particle many a time there will be generation of heat. So, because of this heat again further there is reduction in the energy the wave was carrying to larger distances away from the epicenter. So, anelastic attenuation again can lead to reduction in the amplitude again can lead to attenuation in the seismic waves as you move away from the epicenter. Anelastic attenuation can be quantified with respect to quality factor which is proportional to the ratio of mean energy contained in one cycle to the energy dissipated during one cycle. In addition to this if along the propagation medium there is heterogeneity present again that heterogeneity will cause redistribution of energy that will have effect on the amplitude of the wave. So, collectively when we are discussing about geometric spreading uh, because of medium heterogeneity because of heat because of anelastic attenuation collectively all these are leading to increase in the amplitude of the wave which is reducing as you are moving away from your focus and moving away from your focus. So, thank you all with this uh, we have come to the end of lecture 8 which gives a uh, broader perspective about how one can determine the, the, uh, the magnitude of an earthquake, how one can quantify the intensity of the earthquake, how one can uh, locate a particular earthquake and whenever waves are passing through a particular medium what are the different uh, uh, phenomena happening leading to redu reducing the amplitude of the wave. So, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.